It's a, it's a big pleasure to have here today Professor Shaoli um, Shaoli Ren. Um, at Riverside is an associate there. I was actually surprised, like my memory plays tricks in, in the, you know, with timing of things at, the, at my age, I guess. And um, so he's a very accomplished faculty and he will explain his work, but um, has a lot of visibility in the semantic community and also received many awards, but you know, of course, um, the NSF Career Award, the Future Award. And, but what strikes me you know, is especially is the impact that he, his research is having and the visibility that his research is having in you know, entities that are beyond our usual reach, uh, like the World Health Organization, the World Economic Forum. So we're very excited to, to hear what um, his research is about and the new developments. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Shale. Thank you, Walter, for a very nice introduction. Um, I'm Shao Lei from uh, UC Riverside. Uh, today, I'm, I'm very happy to be here to talk about my work on um, uh, environmentally responsible AI. Um, um, it, it's, it, it's really great pleasure to be here because I don't really have to drive a long distance to my home campus because <laughs> I live really close to the, the campus. All right, so I'm going to start. So I, what I'm going to start with is uh, is something that you you probably have heard many times. So we have seen a huge demand in, in AI computing. So AI systems can uh, play chess, can uh, generate a lot of uh, uh, super real um, images, and have conversation with hu with human. So it's definitely increasing a lot in terms of the AI demand. But some of you might be wondering what's really under what's really happening underlying the AI system. So by the way, uh, before uh, I came to here for a talk, I actually asked, asked ChatGPT to give me uh, some suggestions uh, on what I should talk about. So it actually gave very nice just suggest suggestions, and uh, so re very relevant to what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about today. So what is underlying the AI model, especially those large models? For example, uh, the chat, uh, the GPU three model, it has actually um, one one hundred seventy five billion parameters. So this is a huge size. So uh, to house and train and deploy these models, we need a huge computing facilities. So essentially, we need data centers. These data centers are very resource intensive. And so, uh, although it has a you know this model has a very strong capabilities, but this underlying environmental impact is not negligible. So these AI computing <coughs> servers. So every few years, we're going to be replenish our server fleet. So this the existing server will go into some of the electronic waste. Although they will be recycled, um, some of them will be given a second life, but most of them are still end up being in some dump stations. So this is a huge environmental cost. Uh, alternatively, to run these data centers, we also have some operational costs because this data center uses a huge amount of energy. So a small, um, I mean, a medium scale data center like uh, uh, five to 10 megawatt, the energy consumption of those medium scale data center, each one is gonna be equivalent to a small town of uh, uh, 20 to 50,000 people. So it has a huge energy consumption. To generate this energy, well, typically from electricity, and to generate the electricity, <coughs> the first thing that comes to our mind is probably the carbon emission, right? So we see these pictures, uh, although by the way, this is not really carbon because for carbon, we can't really see, really see it. But this gives us the idea that uh, this electricity generation has a huge uh, pollution problem. On top of this carbon, actually generating electricity also uses a lot of water. So you can see this water vapor coming out of these cooling towers for thermal plants. And the, actually, if you look at the water consumption in the US, the electricity generation is generation is the second largest water consumption just behind agriculture. And of course, we also have air pollution, thermal pollution coming from the electricity generation process. So due to the huge energy demand, there, there's a huge uh, environmental cost for AI computing. And this, energy, this uh, environmental cost associated with the electricity generation is considered as scope two because this is not really direct to the, uh, to the AI computing. However, there is a 
direct path for AI compute, which is considered as a scope one or on-site uh, environment path. That is water consumption. So if you look at this figure, this is Google's data center in Oregon. And you can see this water vapor coming out of the rooftop. And these are actually cooling towers. So if you look at the buildings in the campus, you're gonna see some of the white metal boxes. Those are actually cooling towers. So they, they are constantly evaporating water to get rid of the heat from the, from the AI compute. So this is, a, this is another huge environmental cost associated with the AI compute. So let's, let me just summarize just for how data center are uh, consuming water, because uh, they can deal with carbon, but not so much with some carbon. So on the one hand, we have this offsite water consumption. This is considered scope two due to the uh, electricity generation process, coal plants, nuclear power power plants, and even hydropower. And also there's a scope one, which is considered the onsite water consumption. This is due to the cooling towers. So this cooling power is, uh, is, is due to the open loop of cooling tower operation. The water is constantly being evaporated to remove heat from the cooling tower to the actual environment. But within the data center, there is a closed loop and there's no water consumption because uh, the water is just constantly circulating. Um, but outside, there is an evaporation. So some, some of the data centers are not using cooling tower. They're just directly pumping the outside air into the server room. So this is more water efficient, but still they use water because when the, during the summertime, if it's really hot, for example, in Arizona, in Arizona uh, most of the time it's summer. So they have to pre-cool the air. How do they pre-cool the air in an efficient way? So they are actually using water evaporation to cool down the air and then pump the colder air to the server room to, to cool down the server. And even though in the winter time, when the humidity level is low, they need to add water to moisture the air. So essentially, even though you're using outside air without cooling tower, there's, st there's still a huge amount of water consumption associated with the data center operation. So this carbon is not the same as water because uh, some environmental studies have shown that uh, uh, this uh, water and carbon, they have totally different impacts on our environment. Some people say climate change is water change because water is one of the most immediate consequences of, the, of this climate change and the global warming. <clears throat> and, and also, <clears throat> if you look at the efficiency, let's say uh, we try to minimize the carbon efficiency, that doesn't really mean we're minimizing water because during the long time, that's the most uh, uh, carbon efficient time of the day because we have more solar energy. However, during the long time, that's actually the worst time for water because water evaporation rates highly depends on the outside temperature. If the, the temperature is high, then we have a higher consumption rate. So the, minimizing the water and minimizing the carbon are totally different things. We have to think about these two metrics separately. And we did some of the earlier studies on how much water this uh, large AI model is consuming. And one of the most striking studies we did was uh, these uh, large language models are already drinking a lot of water. So for example, if you're having some conversation with uh, ChatGPT, then most likely you're uh, evaporating 10, uh, 500 milliliters water for each 10 to 50 questions. So that sounds not too much because just uh, like this much water, but if you consider the number of users, the number of questions chat with you is handling every day, this accounts to a huge number of water consumption. And also, if you, <clears throat> if you look at the different regions, um, uh, um, in Arizona, I mean, five, this um, one bottle of water can only support 15 questions. And in Georgia, then this, uh, the same bottle of water can support up to nearly 50 questions. So there's a huge variance in terms of uh, the water efficiency for different regions. And also I want to highlight that this water consumption is different from water withdrawal because water consumption specifically refers to the amount of water that is lost or evaporated in the sky. Of course, it still stays within our, uh, within our planet because uh, just like any other matter, the water is not permanently lost from, this, uh, from the uh, planet, however, the evaporated evaporate water is really hard to get back in, in the short term. So essentially they are considered as a water consumption. That's a technical term. So um, here, uh, whatever their water consumption is, 
so if we just consider uh, geography geography right mm -hmm. so we can just lower water consumption by that i mean we, we just move to colder regions yeah uh, uh, yeah. Or uh, so, uh, places where they have much more renewable energy supply. So yeah. that could be reducing the um, water consumption consumption significantly. But uh, you know, when we try to see, uh, select which location for building data centers, we cannot just look at one single metric. There are a lot of other metrics, for example, the yeah. cost, the tax, um, the tax rates, the bandwidth, the users. So a lot of other factor will come into play when we decide the data center location. And surprisingly, if you if Canada and the U.S. they are fairly close to each other, right? But actually, there Google, Microsoft, those large big techs do not have any data center in Canada, but they have a tens of them in the U.S. So it shows that I mean, look, climate is just one factor when we decide the location. I mean, theoretically, we could put all the location, all the data center in the northern part, and that will reduce the water consumption significantly, but that's just not realistic at this point. So my question is, how would you solve this multi-objective optimization right now? Um, using this uh, workload routing to different locations, which we call geographic load balancing. That's one of our solutions we'll be talking about later. Sure. So I was highlighting the difference between water consumption and water withdrawal, because we when we talk about water uh, consumption, is that means the water that is evaporated into the sky. But when we talk about water withdrawal, that's actually just taking water from the source. For example, when we take a shower, or take a shower, we are using a lot of water. But this water is water withdrawal. We are not consuming water because the water that we take from the shower just directly goes into the sewage system. And if you look at the water withdrawal for AI computing, as uh, the estimates shows that uh, in a few years, this global water withdrawal for both uh, on-site cooling and uh, cooling the power plants will be equivalent to roughly uh, four to four to six billion cubic meters. That's rough, that's almost the four to six times annual water withdrawal of the entire country of Dem Denmark. So it's a huge amount of water withdrawal as well. If you look at the withdrawal metrics, although uh, people typically focus on the consumption part. And you might be wondering, okay, so I, I get the, the idea that it is, uh, AI computing is using a lot of water, but so what? I mean, water is very cheap. It is cheap, but uh, it is a shared and social resource. Every job matters. Uh, actually, if you look at this uh, left figure, which shows the, uh, the uh, which, which is one of the news reports coming from the Guardian, um, it tells us that um, Google was planning a data center in Uruguay last year, and uh, that country was experiencing the worst drought in the century. And the local people didn't have drinking water. They had to drink salty water, but they heard that the Google's data center might be using millions of liters of water each day. So there was a big social protest on the street. And uh, on the other <coughs> side, that was a story for Meta's data center in, in Spain. So uh, we in one of the uh, driest regions in Spain. And that, that also created a lot of social clashes over the water usage of the data center uh, computing. So if you look at the uh, World Health Organization, the new AI ethics and governance guideline, they talk about this water consumption in their report as well. And they talk about this water issue under the societal concerns and risks section. So it clearly shows that water is not only an environmental problem, but also it's a, it's a social problem. And even in the US, so um, I mean, here we are not seeing the water shortage issue in, in in, in the Eastern Coast or in, in the place of Iowa where ChatGPT was trained, uh, GPT model was trained. So Iowa was not a typical state like uh, California or Arizona. It's not a, it doesn't have the, the drought issue as, uh, as we do here in Iowa. <clears throat> but still, train, uh, the Microsoft data center was creating some problem for their local residents because the, they have a peak water usage issue during the summer because they are using outside air cooling and during the summertime, they have to use a lot of water to, to cool down the air. And that was a time when people needed water most. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's clearly a, a societal problem. If we have to get rid of this, uh, not completely get rid of, but try to mitigate this water consumption issue associated with this, this AI computer. So this is what I'm gonna talk about. How are we gonna make this AI more responsible from the environmental perspective? 
So this, uh, not, uh, this is uh, related to in, in mitigating these environmental harms and such as uh, like, uh, trying to uh, allocate the, this water more fairly and uh, reduce the um, water usage associated with the electricity generation. So, so what's the environmental response for AI issue? I ask, if you look at the chat GPT, it actually give these uh, suggestions of uh, three things. We need to talk about sustainable AI infrastructures. We need to talk about the equity issues and also the energy efficient algorithm. So I'm gonna start with this uh, sustainable AI infrastructure as just suggested by chat GPT. So what is sustainable infrastructure? If you have a data center computing, one of the easiest thing you might be thinking about to make it to make it more sustainable is to add, have more uh, renewables. Right? So actually, some of the data centers are already being partially powered by renewables. For example, this one, this is one of the Google's data centers. And for in terms of water, how do we reduce these on-site water? Because uh, um, instead of tapping into the city's water supply, maybe we can harvest the water from the rain or we can get some uh, um, recycled water from somewhere else. So this is Microsoft data center in Sweden. So they're just doing the rainwater harvesting. So, so these are the resources from the nature and we can harvest them and try to use them more responsibly. So, but to use them efficiently, we have to get uh, to, to store them because they're not constantly available. Solar, wind are available only when, when the sun is out, when, only when there's a wind. So we need to store the energy from the, from the green sources. For water, the same. So um, the rain is not constantly available. The recycled water is also a sub subject to the, um, to the to, to, is uh, the upstream. So we need to have some water tank. And actually, the data center already have this big water tank to store the water, just in case there's a water outage. So we can leverage these storage devices to help us become more sustainable. So let's look at the, uh, the AI computing system. So suppose we have a set of uh, clusters, and we're gonna every you know we're gonna make some decisions dynamic over time. So we need to, uh, for example, decide where we're gonna put these AI computing workloads, or we need to choose the model scaling. You know, even for the same services, uh, we have different model sizes. We can choose a bigger model to have a bigger uh, to have a better response qualities, or we can have uh, like a smaller model um, that um, you know. Uh, might have some slightly degradation in terms of the response quality, but that, that can save you the resource consumption a lot. For example, the GPT-3 has have eight different sizes. And from the largest one, uh, 175 billion parameter to just uh, um, a, a, a few, I think it's <coughs> less than one billion parameter to the smallest one. So every time you make a decision, and then you're gonna generate some uh, outcome, right? So the outcome is, uh, it uh, has the latency, has the energy cost, has the response quality, um, has the throughput. So you have some uh, outcome for associated with your resource management decision or the AI system management decisions. At the same time, you're gonna need some resources. Either the resources can, can be coming from the renewable or the water can be coming from the water tank har harvested from the rain, or it can be coming from the utility grid. So there are some resource consumption, there are some decision, and there's some outcome or some reward. So, but this problem is really hard if you try to leverage this uh, limited re renewables and limited uh, water tank. The reason is the demand is just fluctuating so much. So this is the real uh, workload trace by Bloom, which is an open source large language model. So you can see that the demand is just fluctuating very rapidly. And also look at the replenishment side. So when we try to add the um, renewables, we have to rely on the wind or rely on the sand. And when we try to add water, we have to rely on the rain or the recycled water source. So this replenishment and the demand are just fluctuating in, in, in very rapidly in their arbitrary manner. So this is really a hard problem. How do we approach this problem and solve it to make, this, uh, to make this AI computing more sustainable? So I'm, uh, I'm more of an algorithm person, so I would like to formulate this problem in a more rigorous way and then try to come up with some algorithm that are competitive and provably efficient. So this is an online resource allocation problem within Planet. So let's, let me give you the 
uh, a little bit less to make it more rigorous. So we try to essentially try to maximize a reward, total reward over the uh, time horizon of T. So capital T can be arbitrary. So every time you are making some decision, so in a very abstract manner, so XT, as I've show, as I shown, it can be the workload placement, or can be the model scaling decisions, <coughs> or can be the uh, <coughs> resource provisioning decisions. And you make a decision, you get some reward uh, so, uh, due to the um, carbon reduction, because if you're tapping into the energy storage, then you have some reduction in the uh, electricity usage, or you have some um, resource quality. So you have some reward, which is uh, denoted as FT, which means, and this also means the F reward function can be time varying. And at the same time, you have some resource consumption from your uh, either water tank or from your uh, re uh, energy storage. So, and they have limited budget, so it's subject to the time varying budget, BT. And also you have some <coughs> the budget dynamics, because if you're using the budget, then the budget group will be reduced. And at the same time, you also have some, some replenishment, which I denote as an E. So this is a very, very simple problem formulation. And <clears throat> actually, this is uh, what we call online resource allocation with, with, with replenishable budget, because the resources that we consider can be replenished over time in a, in a dynamic manner. How do we solve this problem? So <clears throat> It's online in the sense that when we make the decision, we only know the current information because we know the current workload arrival, we know the current award efficiency, we know the current carbon efficiency, we know the current resource provision, uh, how many resources that we have, but we might not know the future. So a natural idea is that if we don't know the future, we can predict the future, right? So maybe we can learn from the data. So look at the history. So what, we, what happened in the past, but we can predict the future and then mm -hmm. use some MPC or receiving horizon control type algorithm. So basically you predict the future and then you try to solve the problem within the next predict prediction window. And this is a very natural idea, right? Or alternatively, <clears throat> you could just directly learn a policy. Mm -hmm. From your previous problem instances, and then you direct the, apply the policy network to the online decisions. You plug in the online information, whatever you have, and then put it into the network and this will give you the decision. Very natural solutions, right? Any questions about these solutions? Yeah. Uh -huh. So um, here effectively there is a neural network that's being trained to sort of predict. So what is the overhead of that neural network that you are training to eventually save up carbon? Okay. Typically the policy network will be much smaller compared to the actual AI system you are managing. So. Um, there is some overlap, but you know um, the policy network um, is maybe just a few thousand parameters. That's that's more than enough compared to the billions of parameters for large language AI models. It's just nothing. Mm -hmm. So um, you can train it within a few minutes. It's very it's very efficient. So okay, but anyway, so these are the nice solutions we can come up with. But what's the problem with this solution? The problem is you need to get prepared for the worst case. Because the AI, uh, this uh, prediction may not be reliable because this AI, this prediction is based on the history and they try to sort of project the future. And if the history, the training data is consistent with your testing distribution, then you're good. But if you have your testing distribution is very different from your training distribution, then there could be a problem. Just like this uh, classic example for adversarial training, adversarial examples. We put some sticker, which are, I mean, human eyes can still recognize this uh, as a stop sign, but because this training, this adversarial sample may not be appearing in our training set, so the network might easily classify this as a, as a, as a speed limit. So this has, you know, if you have this wrong prediction, your decision could be arbitrarily wrong, just like shown in this example. Although we're not talking about autonomous driving in our exam, in our application, but data center are mission critical facilities. They cannot afford this failure due to the scale. So if you have a network, then you have to get prepared for the worst case, which is just too, too costly for the data center compute. Okay, so how do we solve this problem? Given the fact that we are not able to 100% guarantee the correctness of the network, I mean, it's really hard. I'm not saying it's totally impossible. It could be possible in the future, but it's really hard. So 
let's come up with the alternative way. Let's solve this problem without considering the trade. Let's start from scratch and then let's uh, see what we can do for this problem, for this online allocation without, with the replenished flow factors. So if you look at the literature, they try to solve this problem without the replenishments. It's a very subtle difference. The only difference is if you look at the budget dynamic, there's no replenishment. So basically they have a fixed budget. Whenever they use the budget, there will be some increase in the available budget in the future. Okay, and the, pro the way to solve this problem, although there are different algorithms, but the, the key idea is, is we sort of convert this constraint problem to a Lagrangian relaxation form. So essentially we have a view variable, which is interpreted as the resource price. So this resource price is regulating how aggressively you should reuse your resources. Then the key issue is how we're gonna update these new variables to learn the optimal uh, view. Because uh, there's a one fixed resource constraint, so there's a one optimal view, although we don't know the optimal view, so we have to estimate the optimal view online. So there are the, <clears throat> the idea is that we're gonna set a fixed resource allocation budget. So we have a total budget B0 at the beginning, and then we divide the total uh, the fixed budget by the total horizon T, and then we get an average resource allocation target. If we're using more resources than the reference budget, we're gonna reduce the price, reduce the resource price, or reduce the variable of the view. Then in the next time, uh, uh, sorry, we're gonna, if you use more than the reference budget, you're gonna increase the view. Because the next time you're gonna, if you have a higher price, the auto, uh, naturally you're gonna be using less resources. Otherwise, if you're using less than the reference budget, because you have, you're not using that much, then you can decrease the price and then try to increase more resource consumption in the next stop. So this is a very natural idea. So it's like a feedback loop. So look at how much resources we're consuming compared to the references. And then uh, depending on how uh, we're deviating from the resources, we're gonna adjust the future price. So it's a very natural idea. And there have, have been a lot of, uh, uh, quite a few algorithms to prove that this algorithm, uh, this uh, solution works fairly well, even in the worst case, and in the sense that the, <clears throat> the future workload demand can be arbitrary, okay? But it doesn't really address the resources replenishment. Replenishment, you know, depending on the sand, depending on like if there's a cloud or not, if, if there's a wind or not, if there's a rain or not. This replenishment is not addressed by this frame. So how are we gonna <clears throat> include replenishment in the adversarial settings? So the difference is that we have a different uh, resource budget, then are we able to update the deal by incorporating the resource budget? Uh, I mean, resource uh, replenishment. The natural idea is maybe we can just, you know, if, if you have a more uh, replenishment, then just add up, uh, adjust your reference. Basically, if you uh, put your re replenishment into your budget, into a budget reference, and then uh, compare your actual co consumption with the, res uh, with the new reference. But this doesn't work. <clears throat> the reason is, if you have some resource replenishment now and you try to say lower the price for the next step, but the next step, there could be no resource replenishment at all or very little resource replenishment. So this is too aggressive. You're just uh, looking at the current stage and then you aggressively adjust your resource price. This may not be working in the future when there is uh, arbitrary dynamics, okay? So this is, doesn't work. This uh, solution doesn't work. How are we gonna update the deal? So we come up with the idea of uh, let's, because the future replenishment is very uncertain. We don't really know what's gonna happen in the next. So let's try to be more conservative. We just fix the preset resource budget as before. So we keep the average uh, resource budget <clears throat> as the reference. And then we, but still, if there's a res uh, resource replenishment and there's a, um, we can still use it if we want, but we just don't, incorporate it into our resource pricing. So we call it a cons conservative pricing and optimistic allocation. So the, the overall average mean is called OACP. And each, at each time we collect the uh, reward function, we collect the management and the workload demand. We set the, the first step is to set the target decision. And then we check the budget constraint. In this stage, we're gonna look at the, if we have replenished or not replenishment or not. If we do have it, 
we could pop, uh, we could use it if we if we need, and then we update the deal price, and then finally we update the price. So the difference from the previous algorithm is that when we allocate the actual resources, we do consider the um, allocation. So this is optimistic allocation, but when we set the pricing, we do not consider the uh, the resource replenishment. So this is conservative price. So overall, this is called OACP. Mm -hmm. And can, it, can, can this algorithm really handle the arbitrary replenishment? We need to prove it, right? So we cannot just say, oh, it should or it shouldn't. So we prove that this algorithm for any arbitrary dynamics, arbitrary demand and arbitrary replenishment, this algorithm OACP achieves an asymptotic compatible ratio of low, of low over R bar. R bar is the maximum allocation that, that is allowed. Basically this metric, low is the average resource you have uh, R bar is the maximum resource allocation per time step. So this ratio measures how scarce your resource is. A higher value means you have more resources. A lower value means you have less resources compared to your maximum demand. So if you look at this ratio, it doesn't really depend on the replenishment. It could be something wrong, right? Intuitively, you know, it should depend on the replenishment. But actually, it doesn't. Doesn't depend on the total replenishment, this competitive ratio. Why? Because let's say I give a lot of replenishment, but my replenishment only comes at the very end. And it turns out in the very end, it's also possible that there's no reward at all. For example, there's no demand. So in this case, the replenishment is not useful at all because replenishment is different from fixed resource budget. Fixed resource budget, you can use it whenever you want. Replenishment is only useful when after it has arrived. So if the total replenishment comes at the very end, it's useless. So basically when the replenishment comes matters a lot for this problem, okay? So actually <clears throat> our competitive ratio is the optimal one if we do not have any, any further assumptions on the replenishment pattern. Can you remind me what is star here? Oh, star is the optimal solution, okay. optimal offline solution. Offline, yeah. So basically, if you know all the future information, you can solve the problem offline, and then star is the solution. I see. So the, the problem is a maximization problem. Yeah, reward maximization. I see. So does that mean that the online decision matrix is actually probably will be only in the offline? That's you know, the impact on the No, not, no, because this is this ratio is less than one. Low over, oh, we didn't put the natural uh, upper limit because the low divided by R bar should be less than one. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good question. So this is the optimal solution. Optimal, I mean, in the worst case, this is the best you can do. But there, I mean, how can we use a replenishment? Because replenishment seems to be useless in the worst case, right? It is useless in the worst case because if it comes at the very end, because we can't pre-use it. So how can we use the replenishment? We need to make, because if you don't have any further assumptions on the replenishment, there's not, nothing you can do. It's already optimal. So if, what if there's a minimum replenishment every P star time slot? So basically, Every period of uh, a few period of time, you're, there is at least some replenishment. Under this mild assumption, we can do something. And this is very natural as well, because uh, you know, look at the sun, it uh, comes out every day. If, if the sun doesn't come out, there's something wrong, right? So we, there's, this assumption is pretty mild, but under this assumption, what can we do? Maybe we can just, I mean, let's call each P star time slot as a frame, then a natural idea is maybe we can have the frame level as allocation. For each frame, we apply OACP, right? This is a natural idea, but this doesn't work at all because each frame has its own optimal deal. And if you're doing this, uh, I mean, doing this frame level allocation, then essentially you're tracking a time varying optimal deal <laughs> every, K, every T star time slot. And this is not, I mean, eventually you're gonna incur a linear term that grows linearly with respect to T, capital T, and then you, this term could result in an unbounded ratio. 
So how can we get rid of this uh, frequent changing of our optimal target? Well, we come up with the doubling trick. So essentially, instead of uh, updating our optimal tracking view, optimal view every t star time slot regularly, we're gonna slowly update our view. What, it, what this means is we every time, <coughs> so this shows the, shows the difference between the replenished re, replenish budget and the fixed budget, because replenished budget can, can only be used after you are pretty certain. So there's a discount for your replenishment. And also I, I should point out that our OACP plus doesn't require the knowledge of EU. So although we assume there's a minimum uh, replenishment every T star time slot, but our algorithm doesn't really know that. We just uh, execute the algorithm and see what happens. If E mean goes to zero, basically this value reduces it to the OACP, which is intuitive, right? And also here we're sort of assume <coughs> this bound is clean because we assume the budget cap is infinite. So basically you don't have a budget cap uh, as your constraint. If you have a budget constraint, as, uh, a maximum budget as your constraint, there's uh, the bound will be modified. So there will be further discounting on your replenishment part. So because it's possible that uh, you have a lot of replenishment, but that cannot be added to your system because you're, uh, you're already out of, out of capacity. Okay, so <clears throat> let me just summarize. We propose this OACP and OACP plus for online replenishment, online re allocation with replenishment. And this is actually the first competitor online algorithm for, uh, with a replenishable budget in adversary setting. So, <clears throat> and the OACP is the optimal if you don't have any assumption on, uh, on the replenishment setting. And again, this is an adversarial setting. Basically, the arbitrary, the dynamics could be arbitrary, the replenishment and the workload level, and even the system uh, resource availability. For example, you have some failure in the servers, that doesn't really matter in our formulation. But if you look at these algorithms, we don't really look at any of the history data. We just look at the uh, current, uh, we just track the current price view. And so this is really conservative. And it doesn't really consider the, predict, uh, the prediction power at all. Because although in the worst case, <clears throat> the future uh, uh, testing or the future could be really different from your training data, but in many cases, they're not too much different. So we need to leverage this power of the history data and try to improve the average performance while still guaranteeing the worst case performance. So this algorithm gives us the worst case performance, which is really nice, but it's not sufficient. We also want to maximize the average of performance and given and subject to this worst case performance. The worst case XP pi, it can be our OACP or OACP plus, and lambda is a hyperparameter. Basically, if you have a larger value of lambda, then you will try to be more conservative. And R is also a slackness, that's also a hyperparameter. So this is our actual goal. We want to improve the average performance and at the same time guarantee in the worst case, we have a minimum re reward guarantees, okay? So how do we solve this problem? Because our expert algorithm design is able to handle the worst case, but how do we handle the average case? We can look at the machine learning. We can look at the history data. So this is what we call learning augmented decision making. And it, this can achieve the best of both worlds. Essentially, we are able to maximize our average, average performance and still giving you the worst case performance guarantees. So the high level idea is, because we already have the expert algorithm, like the OACP in our problem. So this, alg this expert algorithm can provide the robust action. And around this robust action, we can construct a trusted action set. Within the, this tr trusted action set, the actions will give you some performance guarantees. And if you have some machine learning based solution, either the machine learning just give you the prediction of the future and you try to solve, you solve the problem using MPC or the machine learning just give you the direct policy. So either way, you have the machine learning based action and you try to map this action to the trusted action set. And then you output the final action. So this is the high level idea. So essentially we are following the machine learning based policy to improve the average performance and the still staying close to the expert to, make, to guarantee the worst case performance. So the key technical challenge is how we're gonna construct the trusted action set. So, so you can not just arbitrarily do that. And the actual idea is, let's just look at our constraint. 
because even though we don't know the future, we know the past, right? So from uh, time one to time t, if we can guarantee that our reward is at least satisfying lambda multiplied by the expert algorithm, the reward minus the slackness, then we should be good. This is a very natural idea because uh, if t goes down to capital T in the end, we are fine. But the problem with this is, uh, although you're greedily satisfying constraint, but your ad actual allocation could be different from the expert. The, ex the expert might be allocating a few resources. They have more resources in the future, and they have more power than your actual algorithm. So this is basically in the future. In the, at this point, you're satisfying the constraint, but in the future, you're not, because you are having fewer resources than the expert. So how do we address this issue? Because there's a potential risk due to the difference in terms of the act, uh, resource allocation decisions. So we need to add up the reservation reward due to the difference. So this design is basically a try to bound the worst case reward gain by the expert in the future. So if you're allocating more resources than the expert, the expert could have a better power in the future, then we try to bound the maximum power of this uh, difference in terms of the reward and to add it up in the constraint. Then by doing this, you can uh, guarantee that in the future, you can, in the worst case, you just follow the expert because you still, whatever the expert did makes the decision, you can just follow that decision. And then at the same time, we try to do the projection from the machine learning decision to the, uh, uh, <coughs> to the trusted action set. So um, this rough idea is, uh, it has been described, but what's the performance? So first, we're able to guarantee the worst case performance guarantee in the worst case. So if for any problem instances, and secondly, what we, which is called consistency in the literature, in the literature, essentially, if the machine learning is performing, performing well, we are able to follow the machine learning, but not strictly because you have the uh, additional robustness constraint that sort of uh, makes you uh, deviate from the machine learning prediction. But in the worst case, we have the bounded de deviation, and this uh, the general I, the inside of this theorem is that. We have a trade-off, I mean, that's just a natural trade-off, which we cannot overcome. And if you have a smaller lambda, basically you are, your robustness constraint is not that stringent, then you could follow machine learning more uh, closely. And if the machine learning is performing well, you can um, achieve a better average performance as well, and vice versa, okay? So this is the general idea of this learning augmented decision-making for a, a sustainable AI. And we're gonna look at the case study for edge data. So it's, uh, we're looking at this uh, 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 language model <coughs> based on Bloom, and uh, we use the solar trees from the Kaiso, which is a California case. And we look at, also look at the reward function. It's a lock. It's a very uh, common reward function for a, uh, for this uh, utility functions because um, each problem instance has a 150 times locks, and uh, we um, all the reward values are normalized. So let's look, look at the average case. For the in, in means in distribution, OOD means out of distribution, basically you have some adversarial cases. So for the in distribution case, the machine learning is performing pretty well in the edge case, in the average sense, and that's very natural, right? So your machine learning is trained on the training data and testing data is consistent with the training. But in the, um, in the out of distribution case, uh, the machine learning is not performing that well. Instead, the OACP plus, because it has a very strong performance guarantee, so it actually has the best performance. So supposedly, a learning augmented should be improving uh, compared to OACP, OACP or OACP plus, but in, this, but in our experiment, um, because we're adding too much OOD on the, the uh, training and testing dis uh, distributions are very different, so that's why learning augmented is, uh, is uh, slightly worse compared to the OACP or the expert algorithm. But if you look at the empirical competitive ratio, and I mean, this, uh, this is empirical value because we cannot uh, enumerate all the possible cases, although we have the proof. So the in distribution, machine learning is performing well because uh, empirically it should be performing well, but uh, out of distribution, the OACP plus is a strong case. So it, uh, it's, it sort of shows the idea of uh, if you are not really confident about your machine learning, you should try to use the expert algorithm. If you're really confident or uh, about your machine learning, you should use a, mach a machine learning-based solution. If you're sort of in between, that's what learning
internally augmented decision making would be having some impact. And uh, some additional results <coughs> showing the impact of this uh, lambda parameter, which is the robustness of this ring, higher lambda means and more robustness. So uh, in general, the in distribution case, a machine learning, a learning augmented case uh, will be performing better than out of distribution. And uh, if you look at the um, pure machine learning, so um, even for in distribution, the, if you have a strong robustness constraint, the machine learning could fail because uh, it, it just is uh, optimized for, uh, for maximize the average reward. And the worst case could be it's arbitrary worse. Okay, any questions about <coughs> the stable AI infrastructure? Now, uh -huh. can you go back to More on all the two steps uh, this uh, uh, delta part. Yeah. Oh, so this is due to the lip. Uh, so we have we have to make uh, assume that the reward part. If you change a little bit from the uh, reward uh, the decision from the expert, your reward will not be that much changed. Because if you change a little bit, the reward totally changes. Then that's not possible. So this is essentially due to the uh, lip uh, coming from the Lipschitz constraint and. Uh, um, uh, technically, this is called potential function. So, if you are you know, due to some stage differences, you have a maximum potential. You try to bound that maximum potential. So, um, for different problems, the design of this part could be different. I will. Um, we have some other work showing for diff totally different design for this delta function. So, this delta is not the same for different for all the problems. So, well, but there are some technical details as well. So this is the uh, difference. But the key insight is we try to bound the maximum potential due to the state differences. So the next part, I'm gonna to come to the uh, environmental equity part of, uh, of AI. So if you look at these uh, uh, geographical differences, I mean, there's a huge difference, right, in terms of the water is yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Wait, I have some questions about the first part, but uh, we, we have to be possibly about 10 minutes to finish. Yeah, I, I think I should be able to finish. So, uh, so the, there's a huge difference. And actually this problem has been realized by a lot of uh, uh, international organizations because uh, this uh, in, uh, and uneven distribution of the environment is costly. And the UNESCO says if you, you should not really use AI if there's a uh, dis disproportional, disproportionate environmental impact on, on different regions. And the state of California report says you, we need to ensure the environmental cost of AI is, uh, is, uh, is, uni is equitably distributed. So how are we gonna equitably distribute this uh, workloads? There's a technique called geographical load balancing or GLB. So we need to add this equity awareness into the GLB decisions. And, but this is a very hard problem because if, normally you try to minimize some cost which I use HD. I mean, this is the traditional cost. And, but if you want to account for this equity, essentially you have another equity term, which we, here we use the LP norm. And this norm is a, is a vector norm. So this LP norm makes the inequity cost inseparable over time and also, also across different locations. So this is making the problem a lot harder. I'm gonna, not gonna show you the technical details, but we have some online algorithm to address these issues without knowing all the features. We also have a learning augmented decision making. So some of the preliminary results are like this. So we have this equitable uh, GLB compared to the standard cost aware GLB. So we are able to look at this PAR peak to average ratio. So the peak to average ratio reduces a lot in terms of carbon, in terms of water. So from 1.68 to 1.22. So it's, the environmental cost is more equitably distributed by using our algorithm. And compared to, even compared to the carbon algorithm, they try to minimize the total carbon, but still they have a big vari variation in terms of the geographical difference. But our equity aware GLB can mitigate this environmental uh, Inequity issues associated with the, this AI behavior. So add a small cost, of course, there's nothing, you know, no free lunch. So um, the, the last part is the sustainable neural algorithms, because uh, if you look at this uh, environmental uh, sustainability for AI, so they have different components. I was talking about this uh, footprint for per energy, but also this per, uh, uh, computing demand per task is also very important. So we, we need to, sort of design the optimal architecture. 
And for example, if you try to design the architecture for different devices, if you have platform like mobile, access, edge devices, there are a, a set of uh, performance metrics. And is op finding the optimal architecture, that's the key technique to, make, to reduce the uh, computing now. And to search for the optimal architecture, because there are so many architectures, one of the techniques is that you need to use a performance predictor. But to build the pre performance predictor for each platform, that's really time consuming. You need to spend a few days to build a performance predictor. You need to measure a lot of uh, instances and train the predictor. So we come up with the, uh, a, an idea of uh, you, uh, exploiting the cross device correlation to reduce the prediction cost and to keep the total cost at O1 and design an optimal architecture for each devices. And then we also have some other algorithm, uh, some other solution uh, related to this uh, learning augmented decision making for sustainable computing. Like uh, we have this, uh, uh, the one that I was talking about is online allocation. We also have other problems, like smooth online complex optimization, and combinatorial optimization, decentralized optimization networks. And also we have considered bandit feedback where you only know the outcome of your uh, of the decision that you actually made. You don't know the other decisions. And uh, our application goes beyond the sustainable AI as well, like the uh, drone systems, the uh, um, e uh, battery charging system, EV charging system, and even the camera tracking systems. So I, <clears throat> some of our recent work is also relevant to this socially responsible AI because the environmentally responsible is part of the responsible AI, but social is it's also important because you want to make sure this AI is behaving uh, in a socially acceptable norm. <clears throat> so what, one of the, uh, our work is uh, designing the architecture to make sure this AI is, uh, uh, is good for our own purposes. For example, generating a coffee abstract, that's a good purpose of using ChatGPT. So we want to make sure the architecture is good for this purpose, but not good for malicious purposes. So we have this architecture designed to mitigate this uh, model misuse. And also we have some ongoing work trying to make this uh, model prediction more equitable for different decision making systems. Because uh, uh, we, we will have the model prediction, we are using the prediction for some downstream decision making. And they have different decision making problems. And they try to, we try to make sure this uh, cost of these uh, different processes are more equitably distributed. So I will skip this part. And finally, uh, I'm, I'm doing some advertisement for my work. So our work has received a lot of uh, media coverage, over uh, 800 media, mainstream media, nearly, nearly 100 countries, like Associated Press, Nature, uh, Bloomberg, uh, Wall Street Journal, Guardian, the BBC, the Independent, and all, any of the major news reports that you can nominate, that you can name in the world. And also we have some industry collaborations with the Qualcomm, with Saluna, Green Pixel, Green Pixel. And our collaboration with Bloom Pixie, that's actually has led to the first water reporting tool for cloud computing systems. And also have, uh, our research is informing this AI policies. I've been invited to write articles about this uh, water footprint of AI, like with this OECD, and also in the um, Algorithm Watch uh, magazine. And the, the ISO will be developing the first international standard on um, on sustainable AI, which will be including water as well. And uh, finally, our uh, work has been cited by a lot of these uh, international organizations in their reports, like the World Show, World Economic Forum, United Nations, and the other uh, <coughs> policy, make, um, policy institutions, including mm -hmm. the US National AI um, Advisory Committee. So this uh, uh, WHO actually includes our research, not only as a discussion, but also includes our research into their official recommendation to governments. Mm -hmm. All right, so I think uh, I'm done with my talk. Any questions? Thank you. Very nice, sir. So I wonder, for your first piece of work, sure. you, you, you're trying to formulate the problem for data centers. Yeah. You're making some assumptions. Yeah. So how much do we know about the data centers? And how many of the assumptions are really true? Oh, actually, uh, data center is one of the application, but our formulation is that it's fairly general. So if you just please check. It's just uh, uh, the whole problem, depending on your domain problem. So in data center, we actually uh, 
know fairly well about, well about the system. For example, if you allocate this resource, uh, choose this model, you know the accuracy, you know you can map this accuracy to a reward. And also you know how many resources you can be consuming. If you don't know that, you can profile that in a real system. And also the resource consumption, this is, uh, you know, if you stand this, uh, um, uh, use this model, use this GPU, uh, this many GPU, you also know the resource consumption. So this, uh, the model is really, uh, you can, it, it, it can be a CMP machine learning model. If you don't know that, we have a bandit set. Basically, I don't know the environment. I know the outcome if I make this decision. So that's a you know, more sophisticated setting. We have some algorithm for that as well. But this problem is, is uh, generally applicable to laser, to drone, to other systems as well. So the sensor is, okay, so that's why we come to online thinking is really penetrable by that. And here, it's motivated by this simple computer, but it's, uh, it's more than that. So here's the basically you talked about uh, operational carbon footprint. Yeah. So how do you account for that and what is carbon footprint? Yeah, that's a very good question. So a lot of uh, people are actually working on this embodied carbon. Right? Uh, one way to account this uh, embodied carbon is to divide the total manufacturing carbon. Into the, uh, into the time horizon, into their lifespan, mm -hmm. and then depending on how long you use the, uh, the server, then that will be your uh, amortized uh, embodied carbon. So whether this is uh, acceptable or not, it's uh, debatable, but uh, some people are using this as a way to account for the embodied carbon into their calculation. So, but that's a, a developing field, which I think is also very important. And we are uh, we have some uh, separate project trying to address this. Uh, what, because if you're changing your resource allocation, let's say turning on and off your server very regularly, then you're gonna have some um, switching cost because uh, you can decrease the lifespan for your servers. That could increase the embodied carbon, right? So we have some uh, smooth decision-making, basically not switch, uh, uh, rapidly changing, uh, turning up and down the servers uh, to reduce, uh, uh, mitigate this uh, embodied carbon. Okay, thank you. So it seems that the problem is has many different temporal scales, right? Mm -hmm. So the workload is probably like very rapidly changing exponentially, but also well, maybe have longer term patterns. But then you're also dealing with like weather patterns, essentially. You probably have a completely different time scale. So how do you? combine this like a different nature and also the, the composite nature of water. Okay, yeah, so um, uh, the weather, actually the solar, it, it turns out is, is changing much faster than we thought because uh, there's a wind coming by, then the solar uh, uh, reflection just reduces a lot. So uh, <clears throat> our formulation is, uh, is, you know, it's generally applicable. So uh, this algorithm is handling the worst case. So basically no matter how fast you change, it's gonna be uh, give you this performance. But in reality, you do use the machine learning a lot. So basically, you try to, you know, uh, using data to tell us okay, what, what should be the ultimate decision. And then we have this uh, uh, competitive algorithm as the safeguard. So essentially, uh, that's why we don't, I mean, we designed this uh, competitive algorithm, but we don't really use it purely as the solution in, real, in reality. We, should, we still sort of uh, look at the previous data that can uh, provide more insights in many cases, although, uh, this competitive algorithm is just a safeguard as the bottom line. But I'm more of an algorithm person for system designs, so I'm uh, um, welcome to have discussion when you're interested in this problem. So it's, uh, we call it rigorous system design. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying other people are not rigorous. We're <laughs> <laughs> all rigorous. We're yeah, <laughs> <laughs> all rigorous. <laughs> Get another building. <laughs> Don't complain about it. But anyway, so well, thank you. Now you can run. <laughs>